And good morning. I'm Dan Kleffler with a special live stream on the tragedy at Sandy Hook and the search for solutions. This morning, that devastated community of Newtown and the families of two first grade boys are preparing to bury their little ones. Funeral services for six-year-old Noah Posner and six-year-old Jack Pinto will be held today. And as the nation mourns, we begin a national conversation to search for answers. The issues, gun control, mental illness, and ultimately keeping children safe. At a heart-wrenching vigil last night, President Obama got serious about change. Can we say that we're truly doing enough to give all the children of this country the chance they deserve to live out their lives in happiness and with purpose. We're not doing enough. Also this morning, we're learning more about the littlest victims and the heroes who gave their lives trying to save them. They include the principal, Don Hawksprung, who threw herself in front of Adam Lanza to protect her students. President Obama held her granddaughter at the community vigil. We also know that in the lone survivor of one classroom is a brave little girl who pretended to be dead and lived. And new evidence suggesting the death toll could have been higher had police not arrived so quickly after those first shots rang out. The gunman's motives, the questions about his mental state still being asked this morning. And across the country, students and teachers are back at school shaken about safety and in many states, schools are conducting safety drills and increasing the security patrols in their hallways. Also, the question of safety is obviously on the minds of so many this morning that are being questioned about, is enough being done? And as President Obama had said, enough is not being done. That change does need to be made. And the pain that so many parents are feeling is almost imaginable. Although speaking about their children is becoming a, a small source of comfort for some. Jessica Rico's parents, Richard and Krista, spoke to Amy Robach on Good Morning America. I got into her bed that she would just gotten out of. And um, we just stayed in bed. It's still not real that my, my little girl who's so full of life and who wants a horse so badly and who's going to get cowgirl boots for Christmas isn't coming home. Are you angry? That hasn't registered to me. The killer's face, the name, everything. I just, uh, I just, I, I see through it right now. I just want to keep talking about her and, and all the things she loved to do. I found a little journal and I don't even know when it's from, but I just opened the book and it was exactly what I needed because it says, I love you so much, mama. It's like she knew that we were going to need, need something to help us get through this. But that's just like what an amazing little girl she was. Yes. And the memories, of course, will continue to be shared. When that tragedy struck, people took to social media not only to share the information, but as we learned more, to memorialize those victims, to call for change, and to now search for means to give back, to help that community in need of healing. Phoebe Conley is senior editor at Yahoo. She's joining us now live from Washington, D.C. Phoebe, there obviously has been an outpouring of an emotion uh, online. Hashtags, everyone is incorporating those to try to see how they can give back and help this community of Newtown. What are people saying? Some of the hashtags we've seen the most of are actually very simple. Um, pray for Newtown, um, you know, prayers for Connecticut. Um, people just wanting to express solidarity with the families and the victims and to show that their hearts are, are with those folks. And there has been a very personal exchange via social media between mm -hmm. a New York Giants football player, right, and one of the victims' families. So Victor Cruz, who is a player for the New York Giants, found out that Jack Pinto, one of the victims, was a big fan of the football player. And so he reached out to the family and expressed um, you know, his support for them. And he wrote Jack Pinto's name on his shoes and his gloves before his game on Sunday and tweeted out a photo saying that you know, this game was for that little boy. And um, th this photo was shared widely over Twitter. And, and also Victor Cruz's name was became trending because people were searching and looking for this tribute to this young boy. As we've been talking about across all of our ABC platforms, we're obviously starting a conversation, a dialogue this week about so many of the important issues that need to be addressed following Friday's tragedy. Mm -hmm. People are using social media not just to offer their condolences, but also as a way for a call to action. How are people using social media to 
initiate conversations about gun control. Right. So um, the White House has set up an online portal. This has been around for some time, which allows citizens to go online and to petition for something. So a petition that was introduced about gun control legislation has been one of the fastest moving petitions gaining signatures that um, the White House has ever seen. It's now over 140,000 signatures. It's the most popular petition that has ever been put up on the White House .gov site. There have been so many issues that have been brought up in these past couple of days, gun control, mental illness school safety. What have been the primary searches that people have been looking for? You know, people really are looking for a way to show their support and their solidarity for families. One of the biggest spiking searches we've seen has just been for Sandy Hook school colors. People wanting to wear a bit of color on their, on their shirt, on their lapel to express their support for these families. All right, Phoebe Conley from Washington, D.C. Phoebe, thank you. I want to turn now to Dr. Janet Taylor, who is joining us. For many, Dr. Taylor, we're trying to simply make sense of it ourselves, but also to reassure children that school, in fact, is a safe place. How do parents begin that dialogue? Well, you begin by being open and first sharing with your child how you feel. We focus so much on how the children are feeling, when in fact, as adults who've experienced loss and certainly can empathize with the parents, we have our own issues. And so it's important not to let our own feelings stop us from talking to to children. So answer their questions. Be prepared to tell the truth. Know how your child reacts in terms of from an age perspective. Sometimes they may ask a simple question. Don't go too deep. Take your cues from them in, far, in terms of how much detail they want. It sounds to me that the bottom line needs to be let the child approach you. Don't try to initiate or force this onto them. Well, I mean, if obviously, you know, screens are everywhere. Your children are hearing about it. You can say, listen, did you hear about what happened? How do you feel? And then take the cues from them. Sometimes you might ask your child or even a teenager to draw a picture, pick a magazine, or describe an experience that may tell you about how they're feeling. How do you, uh, what advice do you give to parents of the Newtown community and the surrounding areas for those that may have had a direct impact, a direct loss or a connection? How do you initiate that kind of a conversation about the, the preciousness of life? Well, you start with their feelings. Un let them reestablish their significance of their loved ones. They may tell the same story over and over again. Be prepared to listen. When I think one of the worst things you can say is, it's going to be okay. And that's our natural tendency because we want it to be better. But for many of them, it's okay to say, I know it's hard, and just stop there. Let them continue to tell you how they feel. Understand it takes time. There is no timetable on grief. It could be years before they feel like they will laugh again, smile again, but one day they will. On a larger issue, and as you know, we've started this dialogue at ABC across all of our platforms about some of these issues that have been brought up following Friday. If a child comes to you asking about guns, why do some people have guns? How do you identify the good guys from the bad guys? Where do you start that kind of a dialogue to try to understand parameters for safety? Well, you can understand what their questions are about guns. And there are many people, whether you agree with it or not, who use guns safely. And I think that's important to recognize. But always say, listen, if you're in someone's house and there's a gun out, leave the house. You know, talk to them about what they would do. Give them what ifs if they were in the presence of a gun, but certainly re-emphasize what we do to keep people safe, and that is different states have gun laws, so maybe you can go and look it up and establish what that would mean for them. Do we need to have a further conversation as far as guns as toys in the media, in movies, television? Is this going to be at the start of a larger dialogue? Well, you know, vi it's exposure to violence, so you could be exposed to a cartoon, but it's about balance. So as much as we monitor what our kids do in terms of activities, it's about balance, about goodness, and reestablishing our own values and letting them know the most important decision makers and people who influence how kids feel are you as parents. So balance the screen time, balance the video game time with face-to-face -face time where you're talking about what's important to you. Lastly, I wanted to ask you about this as we're still learning more about the shooter, the possibility of him having a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Where are we at in the national dialogue about addressing issues of mental illness or behavioral issues? Well, we still have a ways to go. One out of every 10 families will have a child that experiences some emotional difficulty. If it impacts their school life, their work life, their community life, get help. We need to break the stigma and, and, and release the silence about 
about mental illness, talk to your health care provider, know your resources, and if you have a parent that has a child that may have a mental illness in terms of conduct disorder, they're getting suspended from school, many fights, depressed or have changes in mood, talk to your pediatrician, talk to your doctor, and get help for them. Some very sound advice. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much. We okay. appreciate that. Of course, stay with ABC News as we are going to continue to engage in this national conversation, the search for solutions. We'll be exploring the big questions about guns, mental illness, school safety on all of our platforms throughout the week. Updates, of course, also throughout the day on abcnews.com. From now, for all of us here at ABC News, have a good Monday. We gather here in memory of 20 beautiful children and six remarkable adults. They lost their lives in a school that could have been any school, in a quiet town full of good and decent people that could be any town in America. for you to know that you're not alone in your grief. That our world too has been torn apart. That all across this land of ours, we have wept with you. We've pulled our children tight. has called them all home. For those of us who remain, let us find the strength to carry on and make our country worthy of their memory.